Well, hi everyone. So today we're going to start the boost converter project. Now for those of you that don't know, a boost converter is a simple device that takes a lower DC voltage and converts it into a higher DC voltage. Now many machines and systems at one point and another during their operation experience an interesting phenomenon. Whenever the flow of power is interrupted, there's usually a surge associated with it. This happens in mechanical systems, this happens in hydraulic systems, and many other systems. Now usually this is undesired as it could cause a lot of different problems, could cause destruction of the machine. But the boost converter actually uses this phenomenon to its advantage. So the way a boost converter works is pretty simple. A transistor connects an inductor to a source of direct current power. Now what this does is it charges up the inductor, so to speak. Now when the transistor switches back off, the inductor then, having its flow of current suddenly interrupted, is what creates that surge of voltage. And that voltage surge flows through a diode and out through into a capacitor. Now this is a practical way to get from a lower DC voltage to a higher one, as we said earlier. Now a lot of different devices actually use boost converters. A lot of computers have them built in for their displays. A lot of cars use them. So today, I'm going to show you how to make one. Now when you're designing a boost converter, the first thing to consider is what do you want the input and output voltage to be? So I know a lot of times you can't change these parameters, you know, you can only work with what you've got, but if you can make the input and output voltages closer together, the boost converter is going to be more efficient. Now that's primarily because of the pulse width of the transistor. So the further apart the voltages are, the higher the pulse width of the transistor has to be. Of course this means the transistor is going to stay in the circuit longer and it's going to experience more conduction losses. The inductor also has resistance losses too, so the less time it's on, the better. Now the boost converter that I want to make, I want to go from 24 volts DC up to about 340 volts DC, but I also want to be able to operate it at 120 volts DC. So you're probably thinking that's a pretty big voltage difference, and more than likely my boost converter is not going to be tremendously efficient, but in the end I think it will work. I also want the output power to be about 1000 watts. If it's a little bit more than that, I'll be happy, but if it's a little bit less than that, it'll still be acceptable. So I want to be able to run at least a one horsepower three phase motor through the VFD with the boost converter going from 24 volts DC. Now originally I was going for 12 volts DC input, but I think it will have to come up to 24 just for the sake of efficiency and noise and cooling and all kind of different problems. So after you've determined the input and output voltage that you want to use for your boost converter, you need to calculate what size inductor you'll need. Now there's a lot of math that's involved with sizing an inductor for a boost converter, and it's really more than can be fit into one video. But thankfully there are a lot of boost converter inductor calculators out there on the internet. But a lot of them are unfortunately inaccurate. So this company, uh, Coilcraft, on their website has a boost converter calculator. You'll see just here the address. You go to that address and we will calculate using their calculator a boost converter. So it's pretty simple really. You just input the values that you want. We're going to go for 24 volts as we said. I'm going to calculate for 120 volts DC out. I'm not going to worry about the voltage drop just yet. And we'll say 6 amps. And I'll tell you more about the frequency, switching frequency, in just a minute. So as you can see, it gives you the values that you'll need. And it also, this is really cool, it actually tells you all the different math. So if you ever want to come back and you're interested in knowing the math for all of this, it's all here for you. So now we're going to take these values and test it in a simulator and see if it pans out. Alright, so the simulator we're going to be using is uh, the SPICE by Linear Technologies. It's a free download. It's made by Linear, and if you want to get it, this is the address right here that you'll need to go to. Okay, so I've run the simulation with the values suggested by the Coilcraft website, and as you can see, everything seems to be working as suggested. So the blue trace is the output voltage. That's a little bit higher than what we wanted, but that's still acceptable. 
and the green trace is the inductor's current. So it's not 100% accurate, but I'd say that's close enough to use. So everything looks good so far, but there is somewhat of a problem. So the problem is the value suggested by the Coilcraft website, even though it was accurate, was really, really high. And finding an inductor that's going to be able to handle that much current with an inductance value that high is probably not going to be easy. So we've had to substitute it in for a lower value inductor. And I've got these two inductors here that came out of a variable frequency drive. Now these inductors are 51 amps and 510 microhenries. So putting them in series, it'll only really give us 1,020 microhenries. That's quite a bit lower than what was suggested by the website, but will it still work? Okay, so I've run the simulation again, and this time I've substituted in the value of the two inductors that I was actually able to get. And as you can see, the output voltage is still right around where we want it to be, but you notice the output current on the graph, it appears to be a lot taller. And I'll show you what that's about. So, when you can't get an optimally sized inductor, it'll still work, but there will be a lot of current spikes. So it's going to rise to higher and, and fall to lower values than what would normally be experienced with an optimally sized inductor. So it's not the best thing to do. It's going to end up wasting power. It's going to waste power in the power transistor. But basically, if you can at all help it, get an optimally sized inductor. But if not, a smaller one, you know, to an extent, it sh you should be able to substitute. Okay, so the simulation did suggest that we should be able to substitute in these lower value inductors and they should work, although the current spikes are going to be worse. Now just a few other things about the inductor that you should be made aware of. As I pointed out earlier, these are 51 amp inductors. That means you can put more than 51 amps into them, but the amount of energy or charge that they're going to hold is not going to increase if you do. So basically, if you want a higher voltage to come out of your boost converter, you increase the pulse width of the transistor, naturally that increases the current flowing through the inductor. But there comes a point in every inductor where no matter how much more current you keep putting into it, you're not going to get a higher output voltage because it's saturated. So these ones are going to saturate at 51 amps. So you need to keep in mind, you need to keep that in mind when you're calculating what you want your output power to be. Now I said I wanted it around 1000 watts. And my input voltage was 24 volts. So naturally you just do 24 volts times 50 amps. That gives us about 1.2 kilowatts. But there's going to be some losses in there. So you need to keep that saturation current in mind when you're sizing out your inductor. Okay, so the next thing that you really need to consider here is the power transistor and the diode that you're going to use. So the transistor that you're going to use, the output current, the collector current, or if you're going to use a MOSFET, the drain current, should be significantly above the inductor's peak current. So, in the simulation, I think it was around 60 amps peak that we were getting, but I think in reality the peak current might be a little bit higher than that for these. And we also need to take into consideration we, we're getting pretty close to saturation, if not going into it. So once an inductor saturates, not only does it not output you know, any more voltage, but also the current can spike very high, unpredictably and uncontrollably. So you need to keep that in mind when sizing your transistor. So this is the FC300R12 insulated gate bipolar transistor. So this is rated for 300 amps and 1200 volts. So that is a little bit big ideally. We'd want something around 100, between 100 and 200 amps collector current. So, but I do have ready access to these, so we're going to use them. So, basically, the voltage rating of them needs to be obviously above the peak output voltage that you expect, but it needs to be a little bit higher than that to account for the turnoff spike. So, we didn't see that in the simulator, but there's going to be a turnoff spike because of the IGBT zone internal inductance. So the diode, the story is largely the same. This is an S400MQ12. 
and I believe that should be 400 amps and 1200 volts. So basically yeah that one's kind of oversized too. You just need a diode that has a blocking voltage that's higher than your peak expected output voltage plus the consideration of the turnoff spike. So I think 1200 volts should do it pretty comfortably. The highest I said was 340 volts so both these devices should work just fine. But again, you don't have to be you don't have to be so overkill. You could probably do it with a 600 volt device for both IGBT and diode and you could probably get away with a much lower current rating. You could probably get away with I'd say between 100 and 200 amps is a pretty comfortable rating. Now the other thing that we need to come back to was the switching frequency. A higher switching frequency means a lower inductance value, but that also increases the losses in the transistor quite quickly. Because the transistors in a boost converter are dealing with simultaneously high currents, high peak currents from the inductor, and high turnoff voltages, they're going to be dealing with a lot of energy. So I've chosen a lower switching frequency on purpose. The other thing to consider is that some inductors don't like high switching frequencies. These inductors, as I said, came out of a variable frequency drive, so I don't think they're going to like going into several tens of kilohertz. So I kept the switching frequency at 500 hertz. And of course you can't forget about one of the most important parts of the boost converter, the output capacitor. Now this is the one that I'm going to use just because I have them. Big huge thing, 6,000 microfarads, 450 volts DC. But reasonably speaking, 1,000, 2,000 microfarads would probably do the job. Basically that one's up to you. If you need more tight voltage control, like not a lot of peak voltage, a lot of valley voltage, if you don't want Ripley voltage output, increase the capacitance. You can't really put one on that's too big. You know, there's, there's no maximum in terms of capacitance. You can go as big as you want. But in terms of minimum, there's going to be a point where, depending on how sensitive is the, the devices that you're going to use, some devices don't tolerate Ripley voltage. So I'd recommend at least 1,000 microfarads. Now voltage, again, this needs to be well above the peak output voltage that you're going to use. So as I said, I wanted about 340 volts DC. You'll notice this is rated for 450 volts DC. So we got at least 100 volts of extra room before we're bumping up into the rating. Well, it's all well and good if it all works in a simulator, but now we're going to try it out in the real world. Now, this is not a finished project, so pardon the mess, but I do have a test set up rigged here. We have... There's the IGBT, the diode, the capacitor, the gate drive board, and the oscilloscope. We're going to check that turn off spike. And here's our resistor. That's the 25 ohms, those two. And there's the output voltage. So I'm going to start it up and we're going to see how it looks. All right, here we go. So it looks like we got up to 109 volts. So that's not too bad for a first test. So let's check that turnoff spike. All right. So here's the IGBT at turnoff. Down here is the saturation voltage. Whoopsies. Comes all the way up here. Turns off here. Spikes all the way up here. Rings for a while and then smooths out. So as I said, you need to make sure that you put extra voltage, get an extra voltage rated IGBT, extra higher than what you want your output voltage to be anyway. So we're going to zoom out and take a look. I'm going to show you. So this is the battery voltage. We are running off a of battery. This is about a 20 volt battery. So here's the boosted voltage. It comes all the way up here. And I believe that little name is the diode recovering, but we can pump up the pulse width. And as you can see, the boosted voltage rises. 
So I'm going to change the scale. So as you keep increasing the pulse width, the boosted voltage rises higher and higher. And as you decrease, naturally it falls down. So guys, that's going to do it for this video. I'm not going to try to put the whole project in one video. So the next video that you're going to see, if you tune in, we are going to look at the gate drive for the IGBT and we're going to look at the pulse width modulator or the pulse generator so that we can drive the IGBT and get it to fire. So I do thank you guys for watching and if you have any comments or questions, message me, comment on YouTube, give me an email, and I do thank you guys for watching.